Hi there and welcome again to the Explaining History podcast. Today is quite a, a special episode and we're stepping out of our normal time period. Um, it's okay to do that once every so often. Uh, normally I talk mainly about 20th century history um, and sometimes a little bit about 19th century history. But now we're stepping back uh, for a, a special kind of uh, conversation uh, about the, the 18th century. Um, we're looking today at the life of the British General John Burgoyne, who was uh, chiefly known for his surrender to uh, the Americans uh, at Saratoga in 1777, um, after being heavily outnumbered, um, and it's one of the key points in the uh, f- the uh, decline of British fortunes in the American Revolutionary Wars. Um, we're talking to uh, Norman Poser, who is the biographer, biographer, big pardon, of John Burgoyne, who will talk us through not only Burgoyne's life during the war uh, and his military career, but also the kind of the the, the afterlife of um, uh, Burgoyne as a political figure in Britain, a, a member of parliament, and also a famous playwright, uh, managing to kind of bridge the gaps between militarism, um, a political career, and being kind of part of the uh, the, the cultural life of, of Georgian Britain. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Norman Poser now, and this is one of several interviews I'll be doing uh, throughout this year. We've got some really, really great and interesting uh, interviewees lined up for you. Um, So it's going to be really, really a special year uh, on the Explaining History podcast. So I hope you enjoy. Thanks very much. All the best. And without further ado, here is Norman Poser talking us through the uh, the lives of General John Burgoyne in his, from his book From the Battlefield to the Stage Okay, so welcome again to the Explaining History podcast and I'm delighted to introduce Norman Poser to the podcast today uh, Norman is the biographer of the uh, late 18th century uh, British general John Burgoyne um, parliamentarian and playwright and kind of um, society gentleman um, who's uh, perhaps more um, known, ironically, to American listeners who will have grown up with far greater kind of education around the um, American War of Independence. Um, But what I'd like to do is welcome um, Norman to the show. And before we kind of talk about um, the relevance of John Burgoyne, um, I think we need to kind of get a sense of of who he was and why he's a significant individual. So Norman, I'm gonna hand it over to you to uh, educate the listeners in, in the the, uh, the importance of, of Burgoyne. Well, uh, Burgoyne was uh, a um, came from a soldier a family of soldiers, and uh, after uh, he spent five years in school, and but between the time he was ten and fifteen, he went to Westminster School in London. Uh, and then he uh, joined the army, and he joined the army as an officer because he was of the uh, gentry, should we say. He wasn't a nobleman, but he was of the gentry. And he was um, back in when he was about 28 years old, which would have been around uh, uh, 17, late uh, 1760s, early 60s, he uh, got to know... Uh, the uh, he, he was a great friend of the son of the Earl of Derby, uh, had a great estate up near Liverpool, still still exists, called Knowlesley Hall, and um, met the uh, youngest daughter of the Earl of Derby. Uh, and uh, when the, the he was, I don't think the the Earl of Derby liked did like him, but he was he didn't see that he was a, a fit. Um, uh, husband for uh, his daughter, uh, him being a, an earl, and so the two of them eloped. Uh, they ran away. They spent five years in France and Italy. Uh, he was uh, he had he had he had already joined the army, gave up his his commission, 
But when war started between England and France uh, in the early 1760s, uh, uh, he returned to uh, to uh, uh, England, and uh, mm-hmm. the, the Earl, uh, uh, who had uh, not wanted the marriage, uh, became reconciled to it and sort of took uh, Burgoyne into his family. And the Earl, the Earl of Derby, was extremely rich and extremely influential. He was a friend of the King, and um, he helped uh, Burgoyne throughout his career. So and eventually, uh, well, he had a uh, his only uh, service in war was uh, during the Seven Years' War in the middle of the century. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Burgoyne uh, made a reputation for himself uh, in Portugal. Uh, Portugal was an ally of Britain. Uh, Spain was an ally of France, and he went there and he. Uh, made a daring raid on a Spanish uh, town, and um, soon the war was over, but he returned to England as a hero. He became a colonel in the army, and later on he became a general. And by the, by the uh, early times of the, uh, the, the beginning of the American Revolution in the mid-1770s, uh, Burgoyne... Uh, was he he actually made three trips to America. Mm-hmm. Uh, the third one, uh, he was uh, supposed to lead an army from Canada uh, into northern uh, New York State and uh, go through the, the army uh, march through the wilderness. Uh, uh, he was supposed to the plan was, uh, that he would meet uh, General William Howe, who British general who was in New York had 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 captured New York mm-hmm. from from the colonists, and they were to meet in Albany, and presumably they would then uh, try to uh, end the war. They hoped to end the war. This was in 1777. Mm-hmm. Uh, the problem was that Howe decided not to go up there and meet Burgoyne. He decided to go south and to from New York to Philadelphia, which was the capital of the colonies, of the rebellious colonies, uh, to take Philadelphia. And he more or less ignored the fact that uh, Burgoyne was coming down from Canada. Uh, Burgoyne never reached, never reached um, uh, uh, Albany. He crossed the Hudson River uh, north of Albany and where the town of Saratoga was. And there he was completely surrounded by American forces. By that, he, he had, he had um, t- his army, when he started, numbered about 7,400 men. By the time he uh, got to Saratoga after several battles, uh, he uh, he had about half that mm-hmm. force, and he was surrounded by roughly fifteen thousand Americans, and he was forced to surrender. Mm-hmm. Uh, later on, he returned to uh, to England, um, and he uh, was an unusual general in the fact that he was a, a, a quite a good playwright. He had four plays uh, that he wrote. Which were three of them were were sort of social comedies, um, and um, uh, they were all four plays were performed um, at the Drury Lane Drury Lane Theatre in London, which was the <laughs> principal theatre there at the time. Uh, he died at the age of sixty nine. That's a sort of thumbnail okay. uh, uh, just, uh, summary of his of his um, uh, career, but it was. Uh, uh, there's much more to it than that. He sits in an interesting position historically because <laughs> if you go, if you draw a line back to the English Civil War, where you have <laughs> parliamentarian generals, you know you, you have uh, the likes of Thomas Fairfax and obviously Oliver Oliver Cromwell, who have who wear two hats in essence: that of member of parliament, that of general. And then if you go all the way forward to um, the First World War. There are 
obviously the key parliamentarian who serves time in the trenches is, is none other than Winston Churchill. And you have somewhere in, in the middle, in the, in the mid to late 18th century, a, a general and a parliamentarian. And it's, it, 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 it's, I think it's only really quite a modern thing where these things are, are these roles are sort of divorced. Um, I, I think, and I think probably that's got a lot to do with the fact that um, parliament, parliamentary politics in Burgoyne's time would have been seen as a kind of like a, a gentleman's business. It's, you, you don't get paid for it. You're there as you, you kind of like a, it, it, there are all sorts of, of useful reasons to be there. Um do you do you get that that sense from him that this 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 was an individual who I mean obviously he he'd uh, fought for the king in the Americas and served uh, as a parliamentarian that he was somebody that was that was driven by a sense of of duty or was he a more mercenary character than that? Well, he well, believed uh, the, the military uh, was almost like a uh, like a um, sacred to him. He he uh, had been in the army from the time he was fifteen. Um, it was not uncommon, as as you suggest, for um, generals and admirals also to be um, members of parliament. Uh, that created some problems because uh, they their loyalty had to be divided. After all, the king was the commander-in-chief of all the armed forces, mm -hmm. and the king expected the, the, his, his generals and admirals to do what he wanted them to do, to, and to vote in parliament as he wanted them to do. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, but the, the generals and admirals, like uh, Burgoyne, who uh, were... Um, uh, um, had they had a they had a duty not just to the king but to their constituents, the people who elected them, and also to their own conscience and uh, to do the uh -huh. right thing. And that that was a sort of a conflict which Burgoyne definitely had, and he recognized it. He told Lord North, who was the prime minister at the time, that normally he would uh, vote the way uh, the government and the king wanted him to, mm -hmm. but on important matters, he would um, uh, vote his conscience, vote how he thought he should vote. Mm -hmm. And when he did, that infuriated the king, because uh, he, he thought they should... So this was a real problem at the time. There were about 70 generals and admirals who were members of parliament. And there were also not just generals and admirals, there were other people who were on the payroll who uh, were members of parliament at that time. Was his reputation uh, harmed by the the defeat um, of uh, the, the British in um, the Americas? Was, was he personally held to account in any way or um, seen as a, a failure? Well, if I could just uh, uh, answer that in this way, um, uh, the the government, including the um, minister for the colonies, whose name was Lord Germain, um, were very much at fault. They they, they ran they, they, the 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 war had been run in a very bad. Um, inefficient way. Mm -hmm. uh, they had allowed. I, I mentioned General Howe going south instead of north, in, to, and and leaving, abandoning uh, Burgoyne. The, the, he had been allowed to do that by the by the uh, by Lord Germain, mm -hmm. and so the government, in a way, was wanted to cover up its own tracks and put all the blame on Burgoyne. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in that sense, yes, um, he when he returned to England, uh, he, he but he wasn't allowed to defend himself. He he Burgoyne asked for a court martial, a public court martial, so that he could he could defend his reputation and, mm -hmm. and actions in, in America. He, that was denied him. He wanted to talk to the king. The king wouldn't see him. 
uh, the king would wanted him sent back to America. Um, uh, so in in that way, uh, his he, the the he was out of favor with the government. Mm-hmm. But the opposition, the the government was Tory at the time, and the the opposition were Whigs. They supported uh, Burgoyne, and when the Whigs came to power, a few years after he came back. Uh, he was reinstated and he became the commander of the armed forces in Ireland for a, a year or so. Right. So it's a more complicated, uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a complicated story. Yeah, yeah. Did he have the kind of uh, social connections that often these uh, the, 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 these figures require in order to um, to survive? Um, you know, very, very often... Um, particularly during the Napoleonic Wars, lackluster generals that had the uh, the, the the favor of the the king or the prince regent um, had slightly better careers than some of the really good ones. Was 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 Burgoyne well connected, or was he on the periphery of things? Well, um, he was uh, connected uh, because he was uh, he, he had as his sponsor or patron the earl of derby oh yes of course and and the earl of derby was close to the king um and uh the so he, so yes he uh he he was he was very much in favor before saratoga mm-hmm. uh but afterwards uh he the king he was in the king wouldn't see him as i said yeah uh, what's your sense of kind of the, the the climate in in Britain, the political or kind of social climate in Britain after the uh, the, the loss of the Americas? Is this uh, like a huge trauma for Britain's ruling classes, or did they sort of manage to move on from it fairly quickly? Do you think? Well, I think, I think uh, they, they managed. Uh, after all, in the the American Revolution was then followed by uh, the Napoleonic Wars, and uh, Britain was very successful both in the sea and the land. I mean, you had uh, Admiral Nelson and Trafalgar Tet- and other battles, mm-hmm. and uh, Wellington in the, in in Spain, and then of course at Waterloo. So mm-hmm. yes, yeah, I think Britain did recover quite well from it. This one huge. But hmm. very single defeat that they had. I suppose that the way to think about it is, is that you know Britain in the late eighteenth, early nineteenth centuries, there's no way of really predicting that America would become a global power and therefore an arrival to the the, the British Empire and eventually, essentially, eclipses the British Empire. As far as anyone is concerned. Um, you know, whatever America may turn into, uh, there's no indication it'll be that uh, at, at the time. So the, the the sense of kind of what they've lost, I mean, they've lost a a, 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 a significant set of uh, set of um, of colonies in the uh, the kind of the Anglosphere world. But of course, that's not the only story of the British Empire at that time. Britain is starting to look eastwards towards India. Uh, and, and India has been uh, under the East India Company. Um, has uh, it, Britain's control in India has been developing for a, a long period of time. So I, I suppose sometimes it's important to kind of situate yourself in the as much as you can do in the 18th century world view and 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 what what seemed real and possible at the time. Um, with if we look at uh, Burgoyne's kind of later life after his his, his military career, he, he as we said he's a, he becomes a he's a parliamentarian, but also a kind of a a, a a playwright. Was he in the sort of like the the, the kind of the um, late eighteenth century, early nineteenth century world that he in, inhabited in um, in in London? Is he kind of a significant figure in terms of 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 uh, play uh, of writing and performing and things like that? Well, I think that he was he he wasn't uh, in the first rank of playwrights 
like uh, Sheridan or Goldsmith. Ah. Um, but he he was, you might say, in the second rank. Uh, but he uh, his plays were quite popular. Particularly one play called The Heiress was very popular uh, and was translated and and uh, uh, played in other cities in Europe. Okay. And, uh, in Ireland and uh, I believe in Paris uh, and in some German cities. And what's it overall in in his his writing career? Was there a particular were there particular themes that he uh, approached? Were there things that he was trying to say? Well, the, the plays are, are you know different from each other, but um, they had a um, a moral tone to them. They were they were funny, but they were. Uh, he was uh, he, uh, he was a very humane man, and the plays had a moral about being decent, being 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 uh, good. And he he said in one, in one play he had the character say, which I think was what what he believed was that um, uh, self interest. Uh, is uh, uh, one of the chief characteristics of people. But the greatest self-interest is to protect the people you love. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, he was sort of turning that self-interest around. Uh, and uh, he, he was a very, in every way, uh, what comes through is a great sense of, of decency. Uh, for example, as a colonel in the army, he didn't approve of flogging, which was the normal kind of punishment throughout um, the armies of Europe and, and including England at the time. Uh, he believed that uh, the, his, he told his officers that his men, that, they, that the men that they commanded uh, should be treated as human beings. If they had to be punished, it was really a question of looking at what about this particular person. And he believed that uh, he he uh, he the men loved him for that. Even after he was defeated at Saratoga, there wasn't I I haven't seen one word in any that he of any criticism of him by his own officers or his enlisted men uh, in the army. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's a relatively, uh, for, for, you know, that period of time, that's a, a relatively rare thing, um, the, 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 the general who has the, the kind of, uh, uh, the, the widespread support of his soldiers. Um, so, you know, there you you got this this character that has lived this quite varied life, uh, but not in the way that some do, as a kind of like a, and you know there are numerous examples of, of like the kind of the, the chancer that hops from career to career. This was quite a substantial uh, guy. This was somebody who um, believe in, in every phase of his career believed in what he did. What, what do we know about his life as a parliamentarian? What, what were what were what were his sort of political interests? Well, well he um, you mentioned the East India Company, which in in effect ruled India, even though it was a private company. Uh -huh. uh, there was a huge amount of corruption in the in in the uh, in that company uh, the uh, English or British uh, rulers uh, would um, extort money uh, and uh, and receive bribes uh, from the uh, Indian rulers uh -huh. uh, uh, and then they would return to England uh, extremely rich and um, buy seats in Parliament uh, uh, which was possible at the time. Uh, and um, uh, he, uh, Burgoyne uh, tried to fight corruption uh, in, in uh, 
uh, in, among in the East India Company and to get them controlled. He wasn't successful, but he, but he tried. Yeah. Uh, and I say one other thing about uh, Burgoyne, and that was that he was um, uh, he was at heart a reformer, mm-hmm. but he also at heart was very conservative. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, he did not believe that um, enlisted men in the army should become officers. Mm-hmm. He said that the non-commissioned officers, that is the sergeants and corporals in the army, that's, that's a very high position to be in. But mm-hmm. he didn't believe in, in, he believed in the class system mm-hmm. and he was still a reformer. Well, uh, we've got, I can say at, at the time you, you have this, I mean, Obviously, the, the the term conservative now has been so kind of used and abused. It, it sort of almost bears no kind of resemblance to that kind of Burkean conservatism, which said essentially that um, you know that, that, that particularly with views to kind of um, social uh, advancement of the working classes that, you know, uh, the, the Burkean conservatives, conservatism said, well, you really don't want that. Um, there's a reason why they are, um, you know, the, why the working classes are, are as they are. And you, you don't want them to uh, have um, kind of any sort of meaningful power. And partly, partly for that, Burke later on sort of points at the French Revolution and says, "Well, there, there you go. You know, you, these sort of liberation, liber, liberating ideas end in bloodshed and anarchy um, in the end." And I'm, I'm guessing he 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 came from that sort of tradition of conservatism, of keeping the institutions of society, army, judiciary, civil service, and all that kind of stuff, um, free from any sort of radical change. Well, that's. Uh, I, I agree with you. Uh, and, uh, Burgoyne, was, Burgoyne was a uh, a friend, a close friend of Edmund Burke, and 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 was um, uh, uh, when when um, I don't know, in in, in seventeen eighty there the some the, the worst riots ever in England. Mm-hmm. And they, they were anti-Catholic riots. Yes, uh, and and uh, Burgoyne, uh, uh, who was less well known as a reformer than than Burke was, uh, Burke's home was um, threatened. So he uh, gave gave Burke and his family uh, uh, refuge in his own home. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, uh, yes, and and uh, I I think that his political thinking was very much like Burke's. Yeah, yeah. Even and the though Burke, Burke was against the American Revolution, mm-hmm. uh, uh, even so, they uh, he was he they were friends. And the um, I mean I mean these I these ideas which would be considered. <laughs> Probably quite reactionary now. Um, I mean, these these are fairly commonly held ideas at, at the time, um, <coughs> and and particularly when you have you, you have things like the French Revolutionary Terror, there were a lot of people with conservative, you know, these, these Burkean conservative views who say, well, you know, there there's there's the outcome of 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 what you're all asking for. Um, and the, uh, the even those kind of you know the romantic poets who initially thought you know wow what a it is good to be alive and all that kind of stuff you know yeah. what a what a joyous thing 1789 was a couple of years later look at um, the revolutionary terror and think uh, yes well that that one didn't uh, that one didn't go very well um, and there's there's been I mean I, I, I think. Kind of this, this sort of the kind of Anglo-American conservatism for at least a century um, throughout the nineteenth and even into the twentieth century was rooted in this. Um, you know, revolutions are dangerous things. Um, if there is to be change, it needs to be slow and gradual, and we must be kind of very, 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 very sceptical of. Of, of of extreme ideas. I mean, uh, 
this, this, this begins with Napoleon, but you know, throughout the the nineteenth and twentieth centuries, it, 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 it's a thought that kind of maintains itself. Yeah, which kind of brings us a little bit to to full full circle, I, I guess. So. Um, uh, Norman, so what I'm going to do is give the book a brief um, plug now for, for the listeners. But am I right in thinking, has the book now been published or are we awaiting a public a full publication date? I know I've been sent a copy. No, it was published last month in February. Okay, fabulous. Uh, available on all good uh, good bookshops. Um, I and- hope so. I, I, <laughs> I, you know, I'm, in, I'm here in America, so I, I don't know. But uh, it, uh, I believe, I believe it is available. Certainly available okay. uh, online. Okay. Uh, I know that. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, it is available. Yep. Well, I will. When this podcast goes out, I'll post a link uh, so people can purchase a copy. Um, and I, I hope that uh, we'll get uh, plenty of people enjoying it because it is a great read, and it's just a really fascinating journey into a slightly less well-known figure from the period. Um, but based on the conversation we've had, really, should be far, far better known because he's a fascinating character. Well, You're very, very welcome, Norman. Um, and it's been a pleasure to chat. And uh, it would be a wonder to have you back on the show in the future to perhaps talk about the period again, if you'd like to. Be delighted. Thank you very much. Okay, so here's hoping that was useful and helpful and interesting for you guys. And if useful, helpful and interesting is uh, what you're looking for, remember to check us out at www.explaininghistory.org where there's a whole bunch of handy stuff there for students and our newly set up little store, which is uh, full of historical delights. Anyway, I'll leave you there. Thanks very much for listening and we'll catch you on the next Explaining History podcast. All the best. Bye-bye.